read the text quick and then we'll get started here and let you guys sit down for a little while. I'll stand up for a while if you don't mind. I'll put up with it. Genesis 13.3 says, and he went on his journeys from the south. This is Abram. Even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, which is also Ai. Um, later on, we see that just known as Ai. The H has been dropped for some reason or other. But, uh, but anyway, I want, to, uh, I want to speak on this topic this morning, lingering between Bethel and Ai. We can do that. Jesus, you're awesome. We give you praise, we give you adoration, we thank you, we glorify you today, we give you all glory, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy, thank you for grace and truth, thank you for the word of the Lord, for the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of Calvary, thank you for all of it. This morning I ask you for your direction, I ask you for your anointing, I ask you to touch us and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Uh, we were able to go to General Conference um, this last week, and it was nice. Got to spend a few days with Adasa. And, uh, and so I'll try to give some reports on that as we go. Uh, probably, probably tonight I'll probably talk a little bit about it, but um, this morning I want to just kind of get, get moving along quick. But... Um, but just to, just to let you know that the Lord is doing phenomenal things around the globe. And uh, it's just getting better and better and better and better and better to be apostolic in the day that we live. It's amazing. Um, so anyway, this morning I want to I, I wanna just kind of get launched here. Because I, I do have quite a few notes and, and hopefully we'll get, get through this a little bit. But Abram, um, who became Abraham, most of you are aware... Was, uh, was moving out of the land of Ur. He, he was called by God to get out of the land of Ur, which was a, a land filled with idolatry, a land just corrupt and uh, just a horrible place for, for his family to live. And so he was told just to start walking in a particular direction. The Lord did not give him a destination. The Lord gave him a direction. And so anyway, he's, he's also kind of acknowledged as we go, he's acknowledged as a patriarch of the, the Hebrew people, which we would, today we would call them the Jewish people. So he, he was a man of some wealth. He wasn't a man by any means. He was a man of some wealth. He left his home, which today is in Iraq. That's where, that, that's where Ur was of the Chaldees. It was, it was what we would call Iraq today. He traveled around looking for this place that God was directing him to, that God had promised to him. He's looking for it. And uh, he comes to a place what the Bible describes this way. In Genesis 12, verse 8, describes it this way. It says, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. So just to kind of give you an idea, this is east and this is west. This would be Bethel, this would be Hai, and he pitches a tent towards that, and, and, uh, and, and he builds an altar right there between Bethel and Ai. That's where his tent is built. In the morning he would get up. He would turn, I'm, I'm assuming his tent would face north, I don't know. But he would get up, he would turn east and stretch towards the sun and see Ai and look towards the west and see Bethel. Now, kind of give you an, an idea, just a little bit of an idea. He couldn't stay there, though. He wasn't allowed to stay there. The famine was too severe. That's not where God had planted him. So he went down to Egypt for a little while, and then when he returned, he went right back to that place that he had been before he took his trip to Egypt. Went right back to that place. And... Genesis 13, verses 1 through 4, we read that Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram 
was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, and unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. And let's read verse 4. It says, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So it's at this point that it becomes very important to note the significance of these places. Now we, we start to look at these in, in the story. We start to, start to ask questions like, what is so significant? Bethel and Ai are both mentioned in a couple different places. His tent is pitched there. His altar is built there. So there has to be something significant about this spot. So Bethel in the Hebrew means house of God. We, we understand that if, we, if we've studied this at all. It means house of God. Um, that, that's why some years later in, in Genesis 28, we, we see verses 17 through 19 says, And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Now, uh, this the word dreadful it makes it sound like uh, it sounds kind of a, a scary horrible place doesn't it? how dreadful is this place it's the house of God uh oh now is the house of God that bad I mean doesn't it make it sound like the house of God is bad dreadful is another one of those words that we've changed the meaning of just like terrible we think terrible means bad but Horrible means bad. Terrible means awesome. Means mighty. The word dreadful means awe-inspiring. It means holy. It means reverent. Doesn't sound like that when we when we say it because we say it in a matter that in a tone that makes it sound bad. How dreadful. No, it's how dreadful is this place? How, how awe-inspiring. How, how holy is this place? How reverent is this place? So the other place, named Ai, means ruins. It means destruction. Hmm. Always noted in the Hebrew as Hei, or the ruins. The word is used whenever something is referred to as being destroyed intentionally or simply left in disrepair. Now, a house uh, of mud bricks, if you, if you just look at how a lot of these bricks were made, they didn't have the fancy uh, ways of making concrete blocks that we do today. They, they made mud bricks, and sometimes they would fire them in, a, in, in something. Otherwise, they would just let them dry out and crack. And, but uh, left to the weather and the rain, they soon... You soon find out the walls and the foundation and everything. They're soft. They're falling over. They're they're not um, they're 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 not going to hold up to the weather. Uh, being in Israel, it was it was amazing to see a lot of the rocks that they had used. Um, the, we saw in um, in one place, drawing a blank now, but you would know it if, if I talked about it. But uh, Capernaum. Excuse me, um, Capernaum, we saw the original uh, stone work for the synagogue that Jesus would have preached in. And then you see different layers of, of, you know, more synagogues, different layers and stuff that were built up. And you could see the, the materials that they used, had how they had modernized, if you want to call it that, um, the, the synagogue that Jesus was in was just a bunch of just a bunch of rocks that were just stacked up and and then when you get to the Byzantine period, you start to see blocks that were more kind of cut out with with chisels and hammers and then and then when you get to the Roman era, it look, uh, almost looks like they were poured blocks that uh, that they had used of course they were stones that had been tooled and chiseled but but uh, just to see the different styles of of materials. Uh, just amazing, and, and they dug that all out from layers and layers and layers of dirt, dug it all out, and, and it was preserved under there. But Chernobyl, if you recall, Chernobyl uh, abandoned in 1986 uh, after an, a an accident in the Soviet nuclear power station. Before this accident, Chernobyl was 
was home to about 15,000 people. It was you know, a little smaller than the city of Onalaska. A little smaller than the city of Chernobyl was. Now, only a few people remain there today. Um, it was uh, Scientists have studied the decline of the city for the past several years and in order to see how long the structures could, could uphold without any maintenance or any inhabitants, if you will, without people living there, without people taking care of it, without people maintaining anything. They've studied this. Now, the short story is, it, now, if, if human beings... We're, we're all gone tomorrow. <clears throat> Might be a nice thing, right? Just to get out of here. <laughs> but, um, the earth would, would, pro- would just, it would be fine. It'd probably be a lot better off if we weren't here destroying it. But anyway, buildings would collapse, roads would crumble, dams would break, the steel would rust. Everything made by humanity would deteriorate, deteriorate and, and just crumble and, and, and rot away. In just a few decades, it would just be gone. Because nobody's around to maintain it. Nobody's around to, you know, preserve it and stuff like that. So between the house of God and the place of destruction, the place of ruins, is where Abram chose to build his altar to the Lord. He built his altar during a crossroads in his life. He wasn't sure where he was going. Wasn't sure what his purpose was. He, he'd had the voice of God speak to him. He knew he wanted to follow God. But he was in a crossroads in his life. Do I go to Ai? Or do I go to Bethel? Do I go to the house of God? Or do I go to a life of ruin? He was at a crossroads. Builds an altar. How many of us have ever been at a crossroads in our life? Do I serve the Lord God Almighty or do I just go on with life as usual without God? A crossroads, right? A way of decision. Building altars, but not sure which direction to walk. That's what I want to talk about this morning. How often we'll build an altar but we are not sure which direction we're going to go. We're either going to walk with the Lord and have, have a good life on earth, but a, an incredible eternity. Or we're going to walk contrary to the word of God. And we might, you know, we, we might be successful as far as the world goes. We might be able to, build a big business or fall into a real nice paying job and build a fat bank account and have a good retirement account and we might have a a nice home some land who knows what who, who knows what we what we would have because you know the the when people are concentrated just solely on themselves they sometimes look successful or they you could you know you go the way of drugs and alcohol too which that's generally uh, in a world view, that's where wealth lands you anyway. It lands you in a, in a world of chemical addiction. It's kind of strange how the poor are addicted to chemicals and the wealthy are addicted to chemicals. It's just a matter of what you want to pay for the chemical. Kind of amazing, isn't it? Now, social status aside, because all that doesn't matter in eternity anyway. Social status aside, what life on earth is all about, imagine a life, an eternity, without God. The Bible says it's hell. There's a group of people who think that hell is right here on earth. This is hell. Well, not even close. Not even close to what the, the Bible describes as hell. Yet when we, when we take a look at eternity without God, we take it, and people, people are just, uh, they're, they're going crazy today trying to figure out if God is real. And, and it's, it's amazing to me. We, we heard so many statistics. Um, just, just real quickly, I, I want to just kind of talk about in, in California. 
uh, amazing around the San Diego area. Um, the the uh, brother Sergeant, if you guys know Darren Sergeant or um, or, or brother Hodges, you, you know brother Hodges, but um, they they had they had these men coming up in the church and and coming up in ministry and things and wanting to go out and plant churches here and there and and one guy planted a church and 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 he got kicked out of the place that they were renting and and he went back to his pastor he says pastor I don't know what in the world to do and the pastor says don't worry about it he says God's going to give you a blessing here real soon and and he ends up he ends up with a with a building completely paid for and everything that's um, that in, in a fat bank account and. And all kinds of things. Um, he ends up with a with a congregation that had never known Pentecost, but the pastor of that congregation, years and years and years prior, had been Pentecostal. But because he because the way that he went with his ministry, he joined this other group, and he was pastoring this church that was anything but Pentecostal. And so he, he had he'd sat down with the pastor and says, look, he says, the Lord gave me a dream that you would be the next pastor of this church. And so anyway, he, uh, the, the, the board came in and stuff, and they voted this guy in as pastor of the church. And, and, uh, and he ends up with it, and they showed the picture, just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful facility. Huge facility. With a ready-made congregation and everything. And, uh, and, and anyway, he... Uh, so, so now, to make a long story very short, now this group, this denomination, has asked this man to teach their denomination how to get back to Pentecost. And they need 400 pastors within the next three or four or five years, something like that. And they said, we would want them to be Pentecostal preachers. Because these churches, they're all across America. And they don't have anybody to fill their pulpits. They built some of the most beautiful buildings, incredible buildings. They, they're, they're known to be a wealthy denomination. Um, but, uh, but they want to get back to their Pentecostal roots. They want to get back to what the early church was. That's incredible. That's incredible. But, uh, but, but anyway, um, here, here's, here's the, these guys right here. Um, the, he, he's trying to figure out, do I, do I go to Ai or do I go to Bethel? Do I go to the place of blessing, the house of God, or do I go to the place of ruin? Ai doesn't look like ruins, by the way. Ai looks like a beautiful city at the time. It looks like a wealthy city at the time. It looks fantastic. It looks clean. It's all nice and wonderful. It's inhabited by a lot of people, but, but they had no God there that they could serve. They had idols, but they had no God that they could serve. They had idols that they would serve. They had, you know, ideas of this and that, which, you know, but they, they did not have a living God. And so within the context we see Abram asking his nephew Lot to decide. The Bible tells us that flocks of Abraham, Abram and, and Lot had grown too numerous. And so Abram asks Lot to decide which way he will go. In, in verses 9 and verse 11 of Genesis 13, verse 9 says, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me, if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt, uh, if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Verse 11 says, the, Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east. Lot journeyed east. Remember where... Ai was? It was east. And they separated themselves the one from the other. So Lot chose the well-watered plains east toward Ai. While they're standing at these crossroads between Bethel and Ai, 
Lot chooses Ai. So we know that this area was not a ghetto, wasn't a desert, it wasn't uninhabited, it wasn't unwatered, it wasn't dry, and I mean, Lot has flocks to feed. He's not going to go to the desert to feed them. He's going to go to the well-watered plain toward Ai. The Bible's quick to, turn, to, to tell us what happens as a result of the choice. Now, because of the, in the plain of Jordan were the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the first Lot simply pitches his tent towards Sodom at first. That's all he does. He just puts his tent towards Sodom. But later on, we see Lot with an official capacity in the city. We see Lot isn't just looking at Sodom anymore. We see Lot in the gate of Sodom. He was on what we would call today the city council. Sitting in the gate of Sodom in 19.1, there came two angels that sought to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. You sat in the gate of Sodom. It wasn't a casual affair. It wasn't just kicking back, sitting in, in, in this place. It was being an official of the city. It was helping make decisions of what happened. It was, it was determining whether you allowed people into the city or whether you kept them out of the city. He sat in a very prominent place. He sat in a place where, where he was one of the determining factors of whether Burger King started in Sodom or not. Whether they were going to allow Krispy Kreme in or not. Walmart in or out. He was on the city council. He made these choices. Now, early on, you go back a few decades, and his choice was simply to look at the well-watered plains and say, you know, Abram, I think I'm going to choose that. But as he pitches his tent towards that, it all starts looking more attractive than that. The world started looking more attractive than the church. The things of the world started looking better and making him come a little bit closer than the things of God started looking to him. Why do you think the things of the world look better? Because he's pitched his tent towards it. He didn't get out every morning and stretch and look and make the decision anymore. Nope. He just absolutely turned toward the world and put the house of God in his rear view without a mirror. He had nothing to remind him of the house of God anymore. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. He looked at the world every day. The world is what attracted him. The world was his first view at the morning. The world was his last view at night. And as he, as he looked at that, he thought, Hey, I can be a part of this. So he grows into a place where he has a seat at the gate of the city. I get to help make decisions now. But the decisions he made didn't lead anybody back to Bethel. The decisions he made never led anybody back to the God of Abram. Never led anybody back to the house of God. The decisions he made kept Sodom and Gomorrah in sin. He decided legal disputes. He decided if, if a woman was going to go to jail for shoplifting or if he was going to have a, a, a if the, the, the local Walmart had a big sign or a small sign. He got to decide all those things. He helped shape the tone of the city. Hear me. A man who was on his way to the house of God but chose the land of Ai. His decision-making process was messed up.
because of the way he decided to face. That's where so many people are today. They're in that crossroads. Which way do I go? Do I go to the well-watered plains of the world or do I go to the house of God? The house of God may not be the most attractive place on earth, but I'm not living for the things of this earth. The house of God may not have walls of gold today, but I'm going to walk on streets of gold for eternity. May not have gates of jasper and pearl today, but for eternity I'm going to enjoy Wealth like Donald Trump has never even thought of. Bill Gates can't come close to what God is providing for his children. The city was evil. So evil that God sent angels to destroy the city. Even today, we have a crime known as sodomy that was rooted in that city, named after that city. When Lot had the chance to choose between the house of God or the place of destruction, he chose going towards destruction. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. He understood which way he was going. Maybe he started out thinking he was going to make a difference. Maybe he thought, I can, I, can, I, I can make that, I can turn that all around. Maybe he thought that he was going to be the one to turn it around. But we don't see him turning anything around. We see the world turning him around. Darkness prevails every time you partake of it. Joshua, just a few hundred years later, we find, we, we find a whole different group of, of, of Hebrews, if you will. Uh, Joshua, they're, they're coming out of Egypt. I mean, at this point, when, when, when Abram went down into Egypt, Egypt was a pretty good place. It wasn't a bad place. If you, if you really study Egypt, Egypt didn't turn bad until they decided to enslave the children of Israel. That's when Egypt turned a corner. Otherwise, Egypt was a place of wealth. It was a place of sustenance. It was a place of protection. Egypt protected Abram when he was there. It fed him. It clothed him. It kept him. It was not a bad place at that time. Egypt Egypt could have, if they'd have done things right, probably could have been the Israel of the day. But they decided a Pharaoh grows up and says, Oh no, we've got to put them in bondage. Anytime you try to put somebody in captivity, you are losing out with God. You can't serve God when you hold somebody else captive. You can't. And so they, the Israelites, they, they'd been in bondage for, for so many years and they wandered in the desert for 40 years under the leadership of Moses and Joshua takes over and, and now the time has come to possess the land. Oh, hallelujah. It's finally 40 years are past. That old wicked generation that didn't believe God died off and now we're going to go. We're going to possess our promise. They're excited about it. They're pumped. They're super pumped. So anyway, Joshua has to, he has to check it out though. It's not going to be that easy. We, we, gotta, we, we ought to know. I mean, yes, God gave us a promise, but, but we better know what that promise consists of. Amen. So anyway, they, 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 God had promised it to Abraham, and now the first battle of Jericho goes well, doesn't it? It goes well. I mean, they don't even fight. They walk around the city, they blow trumpets, they shout, the walls fall flat, they walk in and take everything. They're not even fighting. So they're like, yeah. Now all of a sudden, the whining, murmuring bunch of people that are all dead anyway, they, uh, they took possession of this city and the only thing they had to do is shout to God for it.
Of course, there's a little more to it than that. They had to walk in obedience before they shouted. The first thing they do, however, is to prepare an attack on AI. They're going to prepare an attack on AI. AI is the next place to go to. So they get, they get ready. They get excited. They're going to go and uh, start with verse two, 2 of chapter 7. It says, uh, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth Avon, on the east of Bethel. Remember? Spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, uh, let, let not all the people go up. Let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. Ah, make not all the people labor thither. There are but a few. In other words, don't send everybody, Josh. They're not, that's going to be easy. Basing everything on what they experienced in Jericho, they're saying, we got this. So they say, don't, don't send everybody. Just send about two or 3,000 men up there. And, you know, don't, don't, make everybody, don't make everybody work too hard. We're not going to have to work very hard at all. There's not much there. And, uh, and, and so, here they are. Says, they're, they're just but a few. So Josh was faced with a decision. God miraculously saves them from Jericho. I mean, it's just a, a wonderful story. Read the book of Joshua. You'll enjoy it. It's, it's, it's an awesome book. God just gave them a, a huge victory in Jericho. If you'll recall, he told them, everything belongs to me. So God said, everything belongs to me. It's a form of tithe. The first fruits are the Lord's. Period. Can't change it. Can't change it, can't steal it. And so anyway, they, uh, but, but, but here, here they are. There's, um, when faced with AI, Joshua makes the fatal mistake of relying on just his people for the victory. It's fatal. Well, we're going to go. But we're only going to take two or 3,000 of our own guys. And apparently, we don't need God. You see him going without asking the Lord for his advice. They said there's only a few people in, the, in, in AI, so, so Joshua makes a decision to go up to the place of destruction without consulting God. Hmm. Goes up under his own power to the place of destruction. Now, now listen here. Listen. God was going to give them AI. But they still needed God to conquer it. He was going to give them AI because he was going to give them all the land. They were going to have all the... The promise wasn't just Jericho and then skip over AI and forget that and just let's go to this town. It wasn't skip this town and go to every other town. No, the Lord gave them all all the land. And he said, all the inhabitants of the land. The Lord was giving it all to them. Only thing they had to do is obey him. He said, just obey me. And it's all going to be well and good. Because when we get the directions from God himself, we also get instructions on how to conquer. But if we just say, ah, you know... There's not very many people there. Let's take two or 3,000 guys and let's just sweep in there. And, and, and let, let's, let's go to the place of destruction. It's not destruction of just the AI inhabitants. It's destruction. 
Period. It doesn't choose who it destroys and who it doesn't. The job of this city was to destroy. That's the name of it. Rip the morality out of people's homes. Rip marriage out. Tear children to pieces. Let's destroy whatever comes into the city. It's the spirit of the city. Ruins. You go in, you might hold your head up high. But by the time you come out, if you make it out, you are completely in ruins. You are destroyed. People say, well, you know, spirits, cities don't have spirits. Oh, yes, they do. Have you read about the king of Tyre and Sidon lately? It was the devil himself. When you start reading about the fall of Lucifer and how he lost his glory and everything, he is referred to as the king of Tyre. He was the spirit of that city. He had destroyed an entire city. Cities have spirits. They're called principalities. So anyway, Joshua, he, he, he's sitting there and, 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 and all of a sudden, now, now, if you read the story, 36 Israelites were killed. 36. How many died in Jericho? How many Israelites died in Jericho? Zero. Right? Not a one. Because the Lord gave them the city. And when God gives you something in obedience, you will not be destroyed. There will not be collateral damage. There won't be any kind of failure when God gives you something in your obedience. Right. Say, well, you know, I, I got my blessing, but I lost my marriage on the way. And that's not God. That's not what God does. When God gives you something, when you're walking in obedience, you come out of that thing stronger. You come out of it more blessed. You don't say, well, I lost my family. I lost my marriage. I lost my kids. That's not the plan of God. The plan of God is for us to walk in obedience. And He gives us everything. That's how God operates. I get sick and tired of people saying that their ministry is successful at the carnage of their family. That is not a successful ministry. That's a failure. You don't lose with God. You gain with God. So anyway, Joshua, he, he doesn't consult God. He loses 36 men out of two or 3,000. We would say that's not a bad deal. But Joshua hit his face at an altar and said, God, what happened? You told us you're giving us a city. You told us it was ours. The Lord said, get off your face. He did. Read it. He says, get up off your face. Israel has partaken in the accursed thing. That's why there's 36 dead bodies laying out there. Because somebody disobeyed. I was going to give you the city. But you charged in there thinking you're going to do it all on your own effort. And you partook of the accursed thing. And so Josh is like, well, 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 what are you talking about? We partook of the accursed thing. How, how, can you, how can you say that? He says, I want you to start calling them out. And so they went through, they went through, they called out a tribe. Then from a tribe, they called out a family. Then from a family, they called out somebody else. And finally, it comes down to a man named Achan. And so Joshua says, hey, why don't you give God praise? Tell us what you've done. Well, I, I did. I sinned. I, I did take of the accursed thing. I saw a goodly Babylonian garment. And I saw what was a wedge of gold and a thing of silver or something he, he he stole some stuff from Jericho when the Lord said it's all mine everything that's in Jericho is mine 
But he, he, he took some souvenirs, if you will. And he went and he hid it. And 36 of his brethren died as a result of his souvenir. The bad thing is, the Lord said, take Achan and all that he has and burn him with fire. It's horrible, horrible. The Bible says he took you. Took Achan and his family out. Even his cattle and his donkeys. Took them out and stoned them all. Killed them all. And then had a bonfire with them. Burned them all. So that the accursed would be purged from the children of Israel. God means business. I mean, he means business. You could say, well, that's not a merciful God, but I, I, I dare to, I, I, I disagree. That is a merciful God. 36, 36 men died because of that man's sin. So the Lord decided, let's get rid of that man's sin to somehow, I, I don't know, I, I don't know how you, how you balance it, but that was justification for the 36 men that died. Who knows what their families left behind. The Lord said, let's purge. Somehow or another, we've got to make reconciliation for those 36 that are dead because of your disobedience. It's a hard story. The story that, that we, we, we read and we scratch our head and we say, Lord, help us, help us. And right after that, right after that is settled, right after all that's done, the Lord says, all right, now Josh, it's ready to go. Verse 1 of chapter 8, and the Lord said unto Joshua, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee. Arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given it into thine hand. The king of Ai and his people and his city and his land, I have given it to you. But you wait for my orders. Don't go in your own effort. Don't go in your own orders. When I say stop and sleep, I mean stop and sleep. When I say get up and go, I don't mean just take two or three thousand. Take them all. I'm going to give it to you. But you better wait for me to say go. If you try to go on your own, you try to go too soon, or you go too late, you just sit back and you decide when you're going. It, 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 we've, we've got a spirit in America that says, I want what I want, and I want it now when I say I want it. And now we've got, we've got so many people. I, I mean, Dave Ramsey is making a multi-million dollar a year business out of telling people just how to be smart with their money. Because all too often we're just pouring debt in because we want it now. We want it now. We want it now. And now all of a sudden we owe everybody but ourselves millions of dollars. Spirit. And so we got people that are making millions of dollars just telling us how to have sense. Get back to common sense. You know, the crazy thing is, I took Dave Ramsey's class. I think it's a fantastic class. I think it's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but I, I paid $29 for this Bible. And it teaches me more than I need to know about stewardship. Teaches me a whole lot more than Dave Ramsey can ever teach me about stewardship. I don't have to sit and watch a video. I don't have to read his book. Because I can read his book. And he wrote this long before Dave Ramsey ever went bankrupt and decided to get smart. I'm not knocking Dave Ramsey. I, I, I listen to him on the radio. He's got good stuff. But he does everything based on this. Well, I've got enough education. I can read this for myself. Thank you, Dave. 
Glad you told me to read my Bible. I've been preaching it forever. How come I'm not a millionaire? I should be a millionaire. I teach people how to pay tithes and nobody does it. He tells them and, and he makes millions. Which way do I decide to go? Which way do I decide? Do I go to the house of God? Or do I go to the place of destruction? Lingering, just lingering between Bethel and Ai. People are living there. You see them, I see them. A recent poll said 92% of Americans believe in God. Yet, only 40% claim to attend church. And the actual 18.2% actually do attend church. That leaves 72% of Americans building an altar between Bethel and Ai. 72%. I put an altar right here. Looking at AI, part of their day. Looking at Bethel, part of their day. Which way do I go? I say I believe in God. That's why I build an altar. I say that I attend church, so I probably should go on Christmas and Easter. But the rest of my life, maybe you think you need to fit into a crowd. I'd rather fit into a Jesus crowd any day. We get criticized a lot, but hey, we're clean. I sleep good. I don't have a hangover. I get to love people. I don't, have to, I don't have to walk with hatred and malice in my heart. I don't have to, feel, I don't have to fit into the crowd of, of hateful, angry people. I can fit into the crowd of the joyful. I don't have to, I don't have to wonder where my next meal's coming from. I don't, have to, I don't have to sit and beg. I don't have to, I don't have to steal. I don't, I just, I'd rather fit into that Jesus crowd anyway. Oh, I know there's people in the club, the Jesus Club, the JC. I know there's always, there's always going to be that group of people who don't quite get it. I understand. But let them keep coming. They'll get it someday. Someday they'll get it. We're not kicking anybody out of the club. I'd rather be Jesus Church than Jesus Club. But we're not kicking anybody out because sooner or later, sooner or later, they'll get it. If they, if they, they read the book, if they seek the God of the book, they'll get it sooner or later. I know there's always, there's always somebody who, who doesn't quite get it. I understand that. I was one of them at one time that didn't quite get it. I couldn't figure out what in the world y'all were doing half the time. I just sat and watched you like, what is wrong with these crazy people? Why do they do this and why do they do that? But I went back to the book. And I said, oh, that's right. They don't do it for themselves. You see, the great thing about being an apostolic is I've got a God a whole lot bigger than a statue. I've got a God that goes every single place I go. Every place I go. Every place I go. He goes with me. I don't go and visit the Lord every now and then. And just talk to him like he's a flower on the wall. And then walk away and try to imagine what he looks like. Until I can get back to that 
flower on the wall. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, that's not my God. My God goes everywhere with me. I don't get up in the morning and wonder, hmm, am I going to the house of God today or am I going to the place of destruction and ruin today? I don't get up and wonder that because I've let him in. He has declared me to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. So now ruin is off the table. AI is nowhere in the mindset. It's not there. Well, what if I fail? I'm not going to. If I stumble, he picks me up. But I'm not going to fail. I've got a whole book of instruction. If I fail, it's because I decide to shut him off. I don't fail on purpose. What if, what if I don't make it? That's, that's off the table. I have already have a destination. I have a map. I already know where I'm going. Anybody ever figure out you got to go somewhere and you check the map and you know you're going to get there? Uh-huh. We've got that. We, we've got it. We've got it right here. We've got it right here. I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about whether Google has, has updated their GPS or not. Jesus has already given me the destination and he's given me the map on how to get there. I am not sitting around wondering, scratching my head, wondering if I'm lost. I have confidence that as long as I keep referring to the map, I'm going to make it. It's not a question. People are always questioning. Well, I don't know if I can do this. No, I don't know if I can live for God. If that's your attitude, you can't live for God. Because you got your brains too wrapped up in AI. That's where people's minds are when they're questioning whether they can serve God or not. It's because they get up every morning and they stretch toward AI. Why don't we get up and start stretching toward Bethel? And don't build your altar between. Get to Bethel and build your altar. Build your altar at the house of God. Not between Bethel and Ai. Come on somebody. People say, well I believe all religions lead to God. That's like going to the airport and saying, it doesn't matter what plane I get on, they're all going to Atlanta. And you get on an airplane and you find yourself sitting in O'Hare International and you're wondering, wow, Atlanta sure has changed. What do you mean I'm not in Atlanta? All airplanes lead to Atlanta. What's this place? I'm afraid too many people are going to start reading this book and then they're going to mix it with the Quran or they're going to mix it with the, the, the Satanic Bible or the Book of Mormon and say, well, it looks to me like they all lead to heaven and you wake up in the first resurrection morning and you're not there. And it's flames and torment. allow ourselves to get off the map we have got to make it to Bethel people say well Jesus was a good person I'm going to strive to be like him but he's not God what it's, it's amazing to me 
It, 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 it just it blows my mind. People, people ask me all the time, well, how do I know what, what is real? How do I know what is real? The last time I was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, I knew it was real. I didn't have to question whether it was real or not. When God filled me with the Holy Ghost, I absolutely knew this is real. When I take on the name of Jesus Christ in baptism, this is real. There's no fake about it. This is life. There's no wondering. There's no question. I stepped out in faith and God blessed. Yeah, yeah. And I say, well, is God even real? Are you kidding me? You don't live this life based on a what if. And too many people are showing up for church wondering, scratching their head, wondering, oh, I don't know, I don't know for sure if this is right or if this is wrong. We've got to get back to who Jesus Christ is. We can't play around with what ifs. Mark 14, 61 to 63 says, And again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we of any further witness? This guy says that's who he is. Of course, that guy wanted to kill him for saying it. But this guy wants to praise him for who he is. I want to praise Him for who He is. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 19, would you stand? says, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up. Are you kidding? If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not then is not Christ raised and if Christ be not raised then your faith is vain ye are yet in your sins and then he says then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most miserable I have a whole lot more than hope I have promises some of many of which already been delivered to me and yet many still to be delivered. But I have promises. God is a God of promise. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption or AI inherit in corruption. If you're waking up every morning, would you come to the altar? You're waking up every morning and you're trying to figure out whether to go to the house of God or whether to remain in a state of destruction and ruin. See, we think destruction and ruin, we think it looks like the results of destruction and ruin. But if you'll recall, when Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, it didn't look so destructed. It didn't look like destruction. It didn't look like ruin. It looked like a well-planed, well-watered plain. It looked like a place that would bless his flocks. It looked like a place that would be nice to grow a family. It looked like a place of wealth. It looked like a place of discovery. He didn't realize that it was going to be destroyed right in front of him. Destruction doesn't always look like destruction when you first look at it doesn't always look like it when you first look at it. Just like a lot of people, they would you bow your heads? There's a spirit of prayer going to start here. Just go ahead and begin praying if you feel that starting on you. Some people, they, they want to take drugs or something because the high looks so wonderful. They want to drink that alcohol because the party looks so satisfying. Only to find themselves in the higher percentile of them. Say, well, I'm only a social drinker, but studies have shown that 
over 80% of those that call themselves social drinkers are actually closet alcoholics. They only drink a little bit out in public, but when they get home, they drown in it. It's a scary statistic. When they're having a bad day, they turn to phrases like, I need a drink. Let's go get a drink. Let's turn this into a better day. When reality is, it destroys their marriages, destroys the relationship with their children, starts to consume their finances, and find themselves in bondage to a chemical that turned out, started out, just as a social thing says, I need to unwind. I think I need a drink. I don't know when our praise and worship services turned into entertaining us, but we better get them back into entertaining God. Instead of waiting for somebody to say, clap your hands, we ought to be the first ones clapping and shouting and dancing before the Lord. Instead of saying, come on, let's take a march around, we ought to be marching around. We ought to be we ought to be excited about our salvation.